Okay. Um, you can, so take a look on all the, I'm getting a lot of questions about the software. Please look on the website first on Blackboard. Um, the, my colleagues are also getting a lot of questions on this. And in a lot of cases, it's been, did you read this document? And um, the document hasn't been read. Some people are running into technical difficulties and we want to really reserve Dr. Eichhorn's time for that. So if it's related to the lab, you should be contacting Dr. Eichhorn. If it's related to the course, you should be contacting me. Um, the other thing, yeah, okay, one last comment, Lara, good one. Uh, ChemDraw, when you should be downloading ChemDraw from the software depot at the University of Windsor. You log in with your, soft, your code and then you download it. That's gonna then tell Perkin Elmer to send you an email to your U Windsor account. Uh, U Windsor loves putting that in a spam folder. So go digging in your spam folder and you'll probably find it in there. Okay. We're only 10 minutes in and we haven't started anything. So nice try everybody. Okay. Um, Olivia, I think I would contact Mobius on that one. Um, they do have a really good help desk and they'll probably get back to you in an hour or so. So they can probably fix that a lot faster than I can. They will make sure that you're, you're good on that one. Um, people who have trouble with ChemDraw downloads, often what we found is that there has been a version of ChemDraw on your computer already. And it might be, you might've downloaded a trial version, you might've downloaded a pirated version, whatever. Uh, you might need to go through your registry and clear off any chem draws. And yes, yeah, the University of Windsor is the name of our university. Um, hopefully you know that. So if you, it, it should be the name of the organization when you put into chem draw to register. And do it through the software depot. Don't do it through Perkin Elmer. Because uh, it, it, some things get a little weird if you do it directly through Perkin Elmer, like look up online where download chem draw. Please do it through the University of Windsor software depot like it says in the instructions on Blackboard. The instructions on accessing all this stuff is on Blackboard. Um, so please feel free to use that. Okay, lecture one. It's not September 11th, but boy, does it feel like it. So uh, review of atomic structures and Lewis structures, and we'll see how this works. Okay, I am going to move my cursor here. Okay. Uh, and somebody has written a song. I'm gonna have to just remove the annotation. Okay, so um, it's pretty straightforward. I think this should really hopefully be reviewed for a lot of you. If it, for whatever reason, doesn't happen to be review, that's a little concerning. And you might really wanna carefully go over that because we're gonna move reasonably quickly through the first few lectures of this course. And my mouse is down here, there we go. So, please hide this, I'm just trying to, Okay, that works. Um, atoms are pretty simple. Sorry, I'm just trying to work out all my software. I'm not actually having too much trouble with the structure of the atom, though it is confusing. So, right, protons, neutrons, and nucleus. Protons give you the positive charge of the atom. Um, the protons and, and the neutrons combine to give you the mass of the atom. The nucleus is really, really, really small. And then you got a cloud of electrons around that and electrons are particles, they're waves, they're kind of wavy particle thingies and quite confusing. Next slide. There we go. Okay, so you can't determine exactly where an electron is, uh, but they are found in orbitals and orbitals are the places where an electron can be found. They're quantized, there are specific orbitals with specific energies in there and the electrons in the orbital have a specific energy. And what an orbital is, is a density function and so you, or a probability function really. Um, so around a center point or around, so if we do a 1D slice, then we have distance from the nucleus along the x-axis, uh, probability of electron density along the y-axis, and you have sort of a maximum in the 1s orbital, a maximum electron density really close to the nucleus and starts falling off after a point. We tend to draw the 1s orbital as a circle and what we write like a circle, the circle. And that's a really shitty circle. Uh, there's a reason I would do an infographic. And what we've really done is we've arbitrarily said, look, 
this is going to be our cutoff on density where we're just drawing that circle. Now, can electrons be found outside of that circle in a 1s orbital? Oh yeah, like they, the electron in an atom in your body can theoretically be on the moon. There is nothing physically preventing that. It is quite unlikely, but it's possible. And to draw the orbital though, we just draw an arbitrary distance out where we say, look, this is most of the electron density probability is within that, um, that shape. So there are different energy levels. Uh, the or orbitals are all grouped into shells at different distances from the nucleus, and each shell is identified by its principal quantum number. So as n increases, your distance from the nucleus increases. That increases the charge separation from the protons in the nucleus. That increases the energy of the electrons. So the lowest energy orbitals are close into the nucleus. As you get further and further away from the nucleus, you raise the energy of the electrons. So each orbital can hold two electrons. The first shell has two electrons. The second shell has eight electrons, which tells us it must have four orbitals. N equals one only has an S orbital and S orbitals, of course, are spheres. They're completely symmetric. So N equals two. So what we have here then is we have two S orbitals and two P orbitals. The two S orbital is a little weird, right? So like the, it sort of like looks like the one S orbital on the inside there. And then you drop your electron density to zero or probability of finding an electron to zero. That's called a node. It's a place where there is no chance of finding an electron. And then suddenly you've got a probability outside of that. And this is where electrons are just freaking weird. They don't actually pass. It's not like the electron is here and then it's here and then it's here and then it's here and then it's here. It's a wave function, right? So just differentially, it is in all those places at once. It doesn't pass through the node. It is in both places at the same time because that is the way electrons work. And it blows my mind and I start getting a headache thinking about it too hard. So the two P orbitals, um, they look like balloon animals. I really love this, uh, this image because they really do look like balloons. They look like barbells. Um, hopefully this is all, I'm keeping an eye on the chat window, and hopefully this is all review and you have seen barbells before, um, but you have this, this weird shape. When we're drawing 2p orbitals, we want to kind of draw this shape. They're all, you've got three of them. They are mutually perpendicular to one another. And so they're each at 90 degrees from each other. The nodal shape here reflects this barbell. You have this high probability of finding an electron close to the nucleus. It peaks and then falls off. And so they look like this. That's what the cloud of electrons look like, but that's really hard to draw and awkward. So we tend to draw them like this. What about uh, n equals three? Um, so in the three s orbital, you got the one, you got the one s, you got the three p's, you got the five d's. Um, we're not going to worry about that because those are very silly. Um, and that's where the silly elements live. Uh, we're going to stick with almost entirely second row elements and first row elements in this course. So oxygen, nitrogen, fluorine. When we run into a level three electron, yeah, they are, they are built different. Um, we actually shouldn't, I shouldn't be like uh, elementally normative here and sort of determining. I, I, I get slightly uncomfortable when I start talking about third row electrons. Um, I'm an organic chemist. So when we run into something like sulfur or phosphorus, those are our third row elements, they can do weird things. So we're going to see sulfur with way too many bonds. Um, and that's because it's allowed to, because it's got D orbitals. Okay, so how do we fill orbitals? Again, I really hope this is all review. You got three rules. Three is a good number. Uh, Pauli exclusion principle, each orbital maximum two electrons. Alpha principle, fill them going up. So start at the bottom, go up. Like energy sinks to the bottom, that makes sense. Hun's rule, so when there's two or more orbitals of the same energy, electrons will go into different orbitals rather than pair up in the same orbital. And that's because it costs energy to stick two electrons near each other in the same orbital because they're both negatively charged and they're gonna repel each other. So if there are three P orbitals, you're gonna line up one of each electron, each of those orbitals first before you start pairing them up. 
then there's the whole thing where if you're putting two electrons in the same orbital, you've got to give them opposite spin. So um, if we look at the first two rows, let's say we're using everybody's favorite element. I have no idea if it's your favorite element, but it will, I, you're not allowed having another favorite element. So let's say it's carbon. So carbon has six electrons. And so if we're filling this thing up in order, we put one electron to one S, second electron, third electron, fourth electron, fifth electron, sixth electron. And so we're following those rules. We're filling from the bottom up, um, opposite spin, two electrons per orbital with opposite spin. And then at the top there, I've got three orbitals. I've got two electrons. I'm not going to put them into the same orbital. I could have easily put one into the 2pz. It doesn't matter. It's completely arbitrary where I put it. Okay. So valence electrons, again, I know you guys have done a lot of this, uh, hopefully. So the number of valence electrons is the number of electrons in the outermost shell. In carbon back there, oops, up, oh, wrong. We had four electrons in our outermost shell. We have the two up here in the p orbital and we have the two in the 2s because this is our outermost shell is the two shell. Oh, I clicked a button. Okay, um, so carbon has four valence electrons. So we hit the octet rule and this came from Lewis who may or may not have killed himself with hydrogen cyanide. And he proposed that a filled shell of electrons is especially stable. And so atoms transfer to share electrons to attain a filled shell. And there's actually a really, really good book. Um, I, I have it here somewhere. It's Cathedrals of Science. It's about all these original physical organic chemists. Um, they were not a happy group of people. And there weren't very many of them and they all seemed to hate each other equally. And so it was, it was a really nasty founding of the field. Uh, and a lot of people discovered things at the same time and then they had a huge argument over who got to name them after themselves. It was like this massive ego trip. Anyways, atoms want to be a filled shell. They want to have eight electrons. Uh, except, so mostly we're going to be worried about the number eight. Uh, which is a number I can count to on two hands, which is about the limit of what I can do as an organic chemist. And the other thing we need to worry about is number two, because that's what hydrogen wants. So there's two ways to become a noble gas configuration. One is you can transfer electron. Second thing is you can share an electron. Transferring electrons is ionic. Sharing electrons is covalent. Uh, I like covalent stuff. Okay. Um, if these concepts have you going, I don't quite remember this. I think I remember something about this kind of stuff. Um, I think you actually covered this last year, but in our textbook, uh, I'm going to just list questions that are relevant to the section that was just covered. Now you can review this. If you're getting, if you're completely lost and all this stuff is like, I've never seen this before. Um, good for you getting this far. And the second thing is maybe go back to a general chemistry textbook and just review this kind of stuff a little bit more because that will be covered a little bit more detail in there. I'm going to talk really briefly about Lewis structures as well. So this is named after the guy who killed himself with hydrogen cyanide. So this is a way to symbolize bonding in a covalent molecule. Um, and it's, okay, I, I, you know what? I think I was overreaching when I say it's essential for understanding organic reactions it's really, really important that you understand where electrons go, and this is a useful way to do it. So what we want to do is arrange atoms so each have a noble gas configuration. So let's say we have hydrogen, H2. So what is that? Well, it's got an H with a dot. So it's hydrogen with one electron. And hydrogen with one electron because hydrogen's got one electron because it's hydrogen. And we got two of them. And the magic number is eight, but this is a first row element, hydrogen and helium. Hydrogen is perfectly happy adopting the electron configuration of helium. And so what if the two, no, no, I did not want to do that. Nope, wrong way. What if the two share an electron? And so what they're kind of becoming, 
draw it like that. Where the two electrons lie between the hydrogens, it's a pair of electrons. And each hydrogen has equal claim to those electrons. So each of those hydrogen has two electrons. We all do like sharing. Sharing is important. Sharing is caring. Yeah, except now we're going to really hit like really complicated marriages. So uh, Lewis structures continued. So let's say we have something a little bit more complicated. Again, hopefully, you know, none of this is all that complicated. We've got carbon. Carbon's got four valence electrons. So we'll stick four. I think I am, re I am recording this. Um, so this is all going to go live. I'm also going to, so I'm going to provide both the PDFs and the PowerPoints up front, whatever you prefer using. Um, and then this is all recorded. You're going to get the video. I'm also going to upload the end result of my scribblings. And so you'll have that as well. So we've got carbon. We've got four times hydrogen. This is pretty straightforward. What's going to happen? I really hope I'm just, Again, if this is not, if you're not bored, uh, please read up on this. If you're bored, good. I'm really hoping you're bored. The, the point at this point is to be bored silly um, because that'll, that feeling will pass. Uh, if we have water, we got two of these. Good, we're not bored. Oh God, okay. So if we're thinking about auction, auction's got you know, you can sit there with the periodic table next to you. You can sit there with any resources you like next to you. Like that, the testing, the evaluations in this course are going to assume open book. So you don't need to memorize shit like how many valence electrons oxygen has. Uh, you might want to because it's a lot faster to do it that than looking it up every time. But, you know, oxygen's got six. Okay. First chemistry class ever. That, that's awkward. Um, so we got you got got some catching up to do then. So we got two of those. Auction's got six electrons. Two of them are already paired up. This is a lone pair. We're going to call it a lone pair. I think you've run into that nomenclature before. I hope. And then we've got two unpaired electrons on that oxygen. So it's going to join them together with the hydrogens. We can do it like that if you like. You can draw us however you like. I just care about the answer. Your operation, a lot of the questions are not going to just care about the answer, but for this, these ones I do. Uh, the way that you do your internal math is up to you. So we're looking at that. And now we're looking at this atom and what we want to do is figure out, does it follow the rules? So what we want, we know we have a good Lewis structure when O has eight electrons, H has two electrons. And so again, I've got two hands so I can count to eight. And I did not mean to do whatever I just did. Oh, shit. Okay. Um, there we go. Two, four, six, eight, and then each of the hydrogens has two. So this is good. Everything's nice and happy. So if we're looking at a more complicated molecule, um, still complicated is a relative term, we've got two carbons and we've got four times hydrogen. And now we need to figure out what to do with that. Um, symmetry is your friend. We like symmetry. Whenever possible, be symmetrical. And so if we're starting to mix things up, I've got two carbons, four hydrogens. So let's start with two hydrogens per carbon. So let's say I do that.
and I've got that. Hopefully everyone can follow. I'm just gonna put the arrow there. So I've taken care of my hydrogens, right? If I count my hydrogens, both my hydrogens have two electrons. They're good. But my carbons don't have eight electrons. My carbons have six electrons. Okay, well, let's stick them together because they're part of the same molecule. So the carbon should probably be stuck together. So we'll loop those guys together. And that'll take us to our next structure. Okay. So that's fine, except our carbons don't have eight electrons yet. Our carbons now have seven electrons. Okay. Um, we're out of atoms. But what we can do is let's stick four electrons between these carbons. Now, if I do my counting, each of my carbons has eight electrons. Those four electrons are shared equally between both carbons, and each of them has four tied up in bonds with the hydrogen. So both carbons have eight electrons. All the hydrogens have two electrons. But now there's four electrons between the two carbons. And one bond is two electrons. And so you have a double bond between the carbons. So we can draw it like that. Where, man, that is an awkward way to draw lines. I wish the equal sign wasn't two parallel lines. I'm just gonna change the color of my equal sign. No, no, please bring up my screen controls. There we go. No, no. So a line equals two electrons. There's actually a book called Organic Chemistry for Babies. It's, it's a good book. Um, it's like a picture book. It's like, you know, cardboard pages kind of thing. I have a copy of it. I don't have a baby. <laughs> it makes as much sense as that. So step-by-step -step procedure. So let's just formalize this a little bit. Uh, we did really simple ones. We're going to have some more complicated ones in the, uh, in the practice because that's the way it goes. Um, decide the arrangement of the atoms, mostly symmetric. Often you want the least electronegative atom in the middle. So often carbons in the middle. And that's because the least electronegative atom, except for hydrogen, ignore hydrogen, is often the one that can make the most bonds. And so it's going to be the one that's in the center. Um, you can count all the valence electrons. You move one electron if an anion, add one electron if it's a cation, uh, if, it's, if it's an anion, add one electron if it's a cation, remove one. Place one pair of electrons between each pair of atoms. Complete the octets. Place the remaining electrons on central atoms in lone pairs. And form double triple bonds as necessary. Uh, this is a root, one way of doing it. I did it slightly differently. The textbook will talk about doing it slightly differently. Another textbook will talk about doing it slightly differently. You use the way that works for you. If you're, again, hopefully this is review. This should be like grade 10 chemistry, I think. Uh, if you're struggling with this, what we just did today, please, please, please go back and read because you're gonna have a really hard time with this because we're just gonna assume that this is all gonna be under the hood processing in the future. Um, I'm gonna leave these because of time for uh, exercises for home and I can bring them up if anyone wants to, or we can def definitely have the GAs bring them up in tutorial. The, the final one is really, you know, I guess that's the level that we need to be operating at for tests and things. Okay. Uh, if you need practice with Lewis structures in the Ogilvy book 1.15 to 1.18, again, if you really need practice with Lewis structures, like if this is new to you, if you're really unfamiliar with this, 
please, please, please um, go back and uh, review this with another course. The Uh, so on YouTube, the chats are not present, unfortunately. Just the or the you have the audio and you have the slides. Uh, there are yeah, the practice questions are also in Mobius, and there are lots of extra questions in Mobius. Um, if you need more practice, you know, I would say go down to the library, but you can't do that right now. Um, go on to a file sharing service, download other textbooks of organic chemistry, and practice doing that. You really should be able to do this. I really hope so. Oh, I'm done. Holy shit. That went faster than I thought. Um, okay, you know what? Maybe we can do one of these. So I can, um, the problem with uh, posting, so I post all these, uh, the videos onto YouTube. The problem with Zoom is it can't store very many. I only get like a gigabyte. So I can only keep a few uh, a week's worth, and so I lose all of them, so you wouldn't do it. Yes, we'll do the last one. I'm, I'm really sorry, Omar. I will try not to cuss. I will try very hard. It is really unnatural for me, and I'm really sorry, and I really try not to do it when I'm teaching. This is me trying. Okay, so let's look at this, and let's break this down. What we have here is it's telling me I've got two CH3s attached to a carbon, which is attached to a chlorine. Then we have a CH2 and an NH2. So what we can kind of do, hopefully, hopefully again, this is really, really review, is the hydrogens are right, right after the atoms that they're attached to generally. This is a little bit ambiguous what's happening in here. That's a little bit unclear. And so I think you, you have to kind of go through it. And some of you will see that instinctively, you know exactly how that's all attached. Some of you won't, that's okay at this point. So let's start on the left-hand side here. We've got a carbon and we've got three hydrogens attached to it. So we can quickly fill those in hopefully. And if we do that and we remember our electron counts, we're still missing an electron, right? So carbon has four electrons. You can put one on each side. Fortunately, we're trying to make four bonds here. And hydrogen's got one electron. And so we can put, we have, and we have three hydrogens. So we have three on each side. And that leaves us one spot where that carbon can now interact with another atom. Okay, so we have that. And we have a, another methyl group just like it. So this is called a methyl group. And we're going to come, I hope, again, I think a lot of you have seen this. Uh, the textbook, all textbooks posted are from the Ogilvy textbook. Um, okay. So we have two of those. Now, if we look on the right-hand side of the molecule, and we look at nitrogen. Now we haven't seen nitrogen yet today. Um, nitrogen is in between carbon and oxygen. Carbon's got four electrons, oxygen's got six electrons. In between probably means it has five. One, two, three, four, we got a fifth. So we pair one of those up. And so nitrogen has a single lone pair and it's able to make three bonds. We've got two hyd hydrogens attached to it. So we can connect that piece up. Then we have the CH2. For those of you who really, really, really like detail on stupid naming, it's called a methylene group. That is a CH2. I'm never gonna ask you what a methylene group is. I think I figured it out some way, it would be too many PhD. I'm really bad at naming things. And so I don't think it's all that important because I'm not good at it. So it can't possibly be important if I'm not good at it. Um, so what I'm not going to be asking is a lot of definitions in this class. This is really going to be driven by problem solving. Okay, so that's that piece. Now we have 
this middle piece. So we have a carbon and we have a chlorine. Those are the only atoms we haven't dealt with yet. And by the way it's written, it looks like the carbon is attached to the chlorine. So we put in carbon and we have chlorine. And so how many valence electrons does chlorine have? So if we pull up a handy periodic table, um, I can't actually do that right now without like turning off my screen and turning it back on, which is irritating, but I can sketch one out. There's a periodic table. This is like a short periodic table. Carbon, it's like the only ones that matter. Nitrogen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine. Okay, it's too big for my box, so I'm gonna extend down below the box. I guess this is kind of maybe important, phosphorus and sulfur, kind of important elements. And then hydrogen's hanging up out here. Often people, like they, you put hydrogen directly over fluorine or you can put hydrogen directly over lithium, it's your choice. Uh, normally modern periodic tables, we often put it over lithium, but it's equally correct to put it over fluorine. Okay, so this is like this is like our periodic table for this class. We will occasionally step in and, and grab one of those freaky elements from somewhere else on a periodic table. Um, but this is this is my comfort zone. For example, in my PhD, I took part in this Olympic chemistry Olympics thing, and we had to you know arrange all the atoms in the periodic table. And it was a I was on a team with a bunch of other senior PhD students, and we did not do well. Um, because we could do the top right hand corner of the periodic table, but the rest of it was just, I have no clue. And I, to this day, I still do not know where all those other atoms go. Uh, the metals seem to take care of themselves. I don't really care about them. This is, this is the important part. Okay, so if we're looking at this, chlorine is right below fluorine, it's right below hydrogen. These are the, the guys who are one electron short of being a noble gas. Like the next one over is noble gas. And this is gonna be really embarrassing. I know helium is up here. I actually can never remember what, I think this is neon, but it might not be. And so I'm not gonna actually write it down because I don't know which my noble gases are because they don't matter. But we're one over for the noble gases. We're about to get there. And so if we have chlorine, it's got seven electrons. Great, yeah, see, I can now pass like high school chemistry. So we've got carbon, we've got chlorine. Let's attach those two together. This seems to indicate that the carbon and the chlorine are attached together. So let's like literally stick them together and that gives us our other part. Okay, so now we got some puzzle pieces. So if we're looking at the way this is laid out, it says I've got CH32C. So that seems to suggest that these two methyl groups are equivalent because there's like two of them and they're right next to the carbon. So if we're thinking about that, it's like, well, I got one electron here, it's ready to make a bond with something. If it makes a bond with this guy, if these two methyl groups bond together, that's it, game over. We don't have anywhere to extend our chain. We've used up all the places we can attach things. So what if I attach to the central carbon and this to that central carbon? That makes sense from this nomenclature. There's two of these next to the carbon, so both of these are attached to that carbon. Now, the carbon is attached to the chlorine and then the chlorine is attached to the carbon, but that doesn't work. This chlorine can't attach to that carbon because it's now got eight electrons and it's got no more room. But this carbon has an extra electron. And so we can, you know, string those babies together. Now that leaves this carbon with one electron and we know CH2 is attached to NH2. Let's patch those two guys together. So we're looking at this whole thing now. Um, we can now, you know, tighten up those sausages that are kind of extended out like pretend they're elastic bands pulling everything down together. And so starting with that middle carbon, whenever you're drawing a Lewis dot structure, I need to see all your dots. Otherwise it's not a Lewis dot structure. So if I ask you on a test or an assignment for a Lewis dot structure, you need to draw the dots. Um, I think it is very safe to assume I will not be asking you for a Lewis dot structure on the final exam. But if you don't understand Lewis dot structures, good luck understanding the rest of this course. So this is 
yes, this is not going to be on the exam. I can actually say that. Uh, it will probably be on one of the Mobius assignments, maybe. And there's like lab tutorials and stuff. And I leave that to Dr. Icorn, and I have no idea what evil plans he has for you. His German accent makes him seem a lot more evil than he actually is. He's a really, really nice guy. Then we have here is we've stuck all those things together, and now we have all the electrons connected up. Okay. Um, share, no, so uh, Zach just asked for any great assignment we cannot use lines for shared pairs. If I'm asking you for a Lewis dot structure, you draw dots. Any other time you use lines. Every other time you use lines. We're always gonna use lines. Um, it's just for Lewis dot structures. And this question here was draw the Lewis dot structure of this. This is a really stupid way of drawing a molecule. The only thing it's really good at doing is it's really good for if you're, if you're having trouble electronic counting and getting a feel for these things is really, really important. Um, some of these seem a little trivial, but if you're getting confused on here, you're going to start losing track of charges. You're going to start losing track of electrons and that is gonna make your life very difficult. So you need to be very, very comfortable with the number of electrons around these atoms number of electrons and lone pairs these atoms want to have, how these things form connections. Uh, yes, there is supposed to be another CH3 on a nitrogen. You're absolutely right. No, 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 no. That's good. No, there isn't. This just NH2. There's no other CH3 up there. Yeah. Uh, so Saba asked me, why do we still use Lewis structures? But she did it privately. Um, we do them mostly because it's, it's good to know the model that we're then going to build more complexity on this. If you have any trouble understanding these kind of electron pairings, it's going to get a whole lot more complicated when we no longer draw any electrons like this. We're just drawing in lines. Your mind needs to immediately be able to count the electrons. And the nice thing about Lewis dot structures is there's one electron per dot. And we can count eight electrons around there. And it's really, really convenient that we like squares as human beings and that second row elements are eight electrons. And they, they work nicely in a square. You can put them different points of the atom. So it's, yeah, I, I, I really do prefer all the questions to be um, public. Yeah, nitrogen's supposed to have five electrons, so it has this extra lone pair here. So nitrogen now has all of its eight electrons of its octet. I think next class I'm gonna talk briefly about formal charges. Yeah, uh, Kiana, yes, absolutely, please. Uh, we're starting with the, everybody has different levels of organic chemistry background. And that, that's the one thing I want to make really clear here. Some, hopefully all of you are bored because this is Gen Chem. Um, there's going to be parts of this course where some of you are going to have covered some of this in high school. There are going to be parts of this course where you guys have not covered any of this in high school. Uh, I hated my high school chemistry. Uh, as far as I was concerned from high school chemistry, organic chemistry was naming molecules and I really despise that. Um, what did I mix up? Yes. You're absolutely right, Sue Hipsy. That is actually the exact same mistake I made when I organized the periodic table in that competition. And why we got even lower than normal is because we got our oxygen nation mixed up. I'd love to say that I was testing you for that, but I wasn't. I just, I, that was an honest mistake I just made. Um, Quinn said my question was dumb, but I didn't actually see it. So that kind of worked okay. Just going up. Can I do the anion real quick? Uh, I can. So the nice thing about a lecture like this is, yeah, we got the 50 minutes, uh, but if I run over a little bit, I, I can finish off an example for some students. So I'm just gonna switch over to doing the BF4. What else do you have to know other than Lewis structures coming into organic chemistry? Um, you're going to need to know how to name stuff. I'm not going to cover naming. I'm going to actually hook you up with this. Uh, it's actually a game website. Like it is actually a game. You get points and you can set the difficulty level and you name organic compounds. I'm not going to go over naming compounds. Um, if most electronegative atom goes in the middle, 
least electronegative atom goes in the middle. Cool. And even then, that is a rule of thumb. It can be wrong. And we can, I, can, I can come up with some examples that are wrong just to mess with you. Uh, naming Lewis structures, I'm sure there's some other stuff that you don't, we're gonna move quickly through bonding models. We're gonna move quickly through geometry models of bonding. Well, all that is review, uh, but we are gonna cover it. And so hopefully we're gonna to touch on most of the things that you need and you'll realize where your weaknesses are. If, you're, if we're hitting something, you're going, I am just completely lost, uh, please let me know. And because what will probably end up happening is I'll get an avalanche of people saying that they're lost in the chat and we will slow it down and, and go back. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna skip to the next slide and do BF4. Uh, I have my mouse cursor in the wrong window. Where is it? There it is. Um, okay, I'm gonna do it here because this, this is a nice empty slide. If you need to run, you need to run. If you don't need to run, uh, it, uh, the YouTube channel is in the syllabus, like everything else. <laughs> Everything's on the syllabus, it's, it, including the wrong number of Mobius assignments. There's only three, it says four. I'll update that once I figure out what other mistakes I've made. So uh, this boron is one of these weird elements that isn't in my periodic table. Uh, luckily, it's just one over from carbon. And so boron has three electrons. Fluorine is in my little mini periodic table. And so I remember that fluorine has seven electrons and there's like four of them. So I, I really don't want to draw four times right now. I'm just going to write four times that. And then plus extra electron. We have an extra electron because there is a negative charge on the molecule. So if we just went with BF4, we would expect a certain number of electrons. We have an extra electron because it's telling us it's negative. So it's picked up an electron from somewhere. Okay. Well, there's a place that's really obvious to stick that electron, that extra electron for symmetry. Uh, purple. Let's put that extra, actually, you know what? I'm gonna be really, this will hold up better. I'm just gonna draw a single hooked arrow. Um, we're gonna put the extra electron on the boron. And so when we do that, we're left with a boron with four electrons. That's great, that's nice and symmetrical. And we have four times F, which has seven electrons. And so at this point, I really hope this isn't challenging. We stick the pieces together. And so we got four Fs. It's a lot of Fs. We got a boron with four electrons and there's an overall net negative charge. And I'm gonna indicate it up there. You can, you can do all sorts of things. You can put a bracket around there. I like this kind of half rectangular bracket. Uh, you can put a full bracket around it. You do need to recognize that there is a negative charge on that. You will be marked incorrect if you did not write negative up there because there's an extra negative over what boron and fluorine can support. Of course, the reason there's an extra negative is look at that beautiful, everything having its full octet system. Like that's how this wants to exist. Of course it wants the extra electron, but you need to indicate that it does have that extra electron. Uh, can you quickly go over the elements with valence exception when bonding? Um, I don't know which one. You're talking about sulfur kind of thing, Bennett? <sighs> okay. Um, so sulfur can pull in D electrons. On the Lewis dot structures, we start getting some very complex things. So, uh, let's go with um, sulfuric acid. I like sulfuric acid. It's useful for disposing of evidence. And so, in this case, 
the software can actually adopt multiple different things. And so we're, when we're, Lewis didn't think much about third row elements and a Lewis dot structure system kind of breaks down for third row elements. Sulfur is happy adopting, oxygen normally likes having two bonds. Sulfur can do two bonds. Sulfur can do three bonds. Sulfur can do six bonds. Um, you sulfur can do four bonds. So sulfur likes being two, three, four, or six, which is very confusing. And what, it, what it's doing here is it's invoking d orbitals into a cyst. Now, the second row elements always use their p orbitals for bonding. The third row elements sometimes use some of their d orbitals for bonding if they feel like it. And so you don't get the same rules. And so it's much, much trickier. So what you have to do here is worry about the other elements first. So we got oxygen and we got four of those and we got hydrogen. Now at this point, there are multiple different Lewis structures you could draw just with that molecular formula. And there's no formal way to tell which is correct. The way you would do it is um, some of them are lower in energy than others, but you can't tell that from the Lewis dot structure alone. That's impossible. So with this case here, what we would do is I know, and I'm, it's sulfuric acid, so I have to have some sort of acid thing. So I'm going to have two of those and two times oxygens without hydrogens. And then again, sulfur, which might be doing something. Um, now the problem with sulfur, of course, is it can actually make six bonds to six different atoms. But we're not going to make a lot of sense out of our other things in that way. But normally, it likes having two, three, or four atoms around it. So if we try with four atoms around it, then I guess we can take care of our two oxygens with hydrogens. And now I am just I'm too close to this guy, and everybody is just squeezed, and it's just squishy and awkward. They're not social distancing. Okay, there we go. <coughs> I'm not sure if the video of this will make more or less sense. Let me, <coughs> then the final drawing. Okay, well, we're there. But we're left over with two of these oxygens. Sure. You know, you can almost just create electrons on sulfur because it's got so many of them. It can choose to use them or not. <coughs> But at this point here, we're left with these two oxygens both having an unpaired electron, and that's not happy. So how can we resolve that? Well, sulfur right now is making four bonds and got eight electrons. But it's, and if it was, if this was, if sulfur was carbon, that would be it. We're done. But sulfur, sulfur is third row element. It's got more tricks up its sleeve, and it's like I got another electron for you. <coughs> so it pulls down another two electrons. Just draw arrows so these things are going to things. So what I'm trying to do here, the logic of how we're figuring this out is I'm worrying about my other elements. I'm not worrying about the sulfur. There's no other way I can arrange these other elements that makes a lot of sense. And I agree this makes only limited sense. Um, but there's no other reasonable way I can do that. And so what this comes out to, of course, is Sulfur making six bonds and sulfuric acid like that. Uh, sulfur has a lot more valence electrons. So sulfur is like oxygen. So sulfur has six valence electrons. Two of them are tied up in lone pairs automatically, but it's also got the third row. This is answering um, Fabian. Um, so it's got two of them tied. It's got six electrons like from its second row tightness in its S and P orbitals. Two of those are lone pairs, two are free, but then it has all these extra D orbitals because it's a third, uh, a third row element. 
and it can start pulling away electrons from those d orbitals. It can start integrating d orbitals into its bonding because it's not using its 2s and 2p to do bonding. It's using its 3s and 3p and 3d orbitals to do bonding. Uh, first Mobius is due in October sometime, uh, beginning of October. We're going to have a practice Mobius in September so that everyone can figure out how to use Mobius with this time thing. Okay, let's be honest. So I can figure out how to use Mobius with this time thing. Um, yeah. Yeah, resonance affects everything. This course could just be called resonance. I love resonance so much. Um, what about boron being satisfied with six electrons? I'm going to get to that. Uh, boron can do six electrons. Boron can do eight electrons. Um, it can do both. Yes, most info is in the syllabus. Um, if you're chem Aaron, did you get your ChemDraw registration code from the Software Depot? Did you download it from the Software Depot? If you download it from Perk and Elmer, you have problems. Okay. Um, and if it's in a syllabus, Emily, <laughs> full instructions on where to download and everything, all the links, everything is in the syllabus. Yeah, I, I, I'm done talking about the software. Um, the software is in the syllabus. If the class average is high 80, I'll be very happy. Um, Okay, I think I've addressed stuff. What was the average last year? I actually don't remember, Hater. Um, ge okay, generally, this class has what we call a bimodal average. I, I, I would love that, that to be different. I will have a cluster of grades around the, the, the there'll be one Gaussian peak with an average of around 82. Um, and then there'll be another Gaussian peak with an average around 58. And there will be very, very few high C's, low B's. They'll tend to be either mid B's into the A's or C's and D's. Um, that's just the way it goes. Yes, there are only three assignments. I decided instead of trying to squish four assignments in, I'll just do three. It just seemed more reasonable. Uh, why? Okay, so I got a question. Why double bond solve for instead of buying two auctions? The problem is if you have the two auctions bound together, um, I guess you could draw something like that. Um, question over here. I normally hang out for about 15 minutes after class anyways, um, just answering questions on this stuff. It's just we're going to record all these conversations. So you lucky, lucky people. So let's see. Let's say we do that, and then I want to bind the two auctions together. So maybe I do that, and then that. The problem is this auction still has, like, we don't need to worry about sulfur. Sulfur takes care of itself. It can do anything with the electrons. But the problem is we have a lone electron here that's not bound to anything. And so that's problematic. Now, one way around that is we could draw something really freaky. Now I'm just spitballing. Uh, I'm actually going to have to make a comment. This is really wrong. Okay. Now I'm going to make that disclaimer. Uh, let's say we dots do not make triangles very well. I'll make a triangle. Just make really big oxygens. Theoretically, that works. And that would be equal to sulfur making a triangle with the oxygens. And that molecule actually does exist. Um, it's an incredibly powerful oxidizer. It really wants to give up an oxygen because oxygen oxygen bonds are not happy bonds. I don't want to focus on that um, because this course, when I took it, 
um, this intro organic course was basically memorize tables of bond dissociation energies and auction auction bonds are very weak bonds they break very easily i don't want you to memorize that because i can't imagine anything more boring um but auction does not like buying auction auction also doesn't like buying to chlorine or bromine those are weak bonds too and they break open pretty fast too and so does bromine bromine whenever you have two really electronegative atoms attached to each other that's a weak bond and so that is a really powerful oxidizer. Uh, you can use it for rocket fuel. And it probably also blows up, just on general principles. I do enjoy a good explosion. OK. I'm not touching that, Suhib. Um, Do you have to name all types of organic molecules? I'm going to give a list of what your what functional groups you're responsible for. Uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about naming stereochemistry, and so we'll cover that. But again, I'm going to put a link up to a game website, which is, okay, it's not a game. I'm, I'm lying to you. It's not a game. But it's a website where you get to name things, you get to set the rules, and you get to practice, and you do that, and it gives you points. So it's kind of like a really lame game. Um, but still, it's good. It's good practice, and you have infinite variety, which is the really important thing. Yeah, I will. I will put a. Um, we can't do explosions remotely. I'm not blowing up something in my house. Uh, when I do this in person, I do do explosions, but I can't do that here. I don't have the proper safety equipment in my office. Uh, I will upload that. <laughs> you have a good future in this, Emma. <laughs> Okay. Um, I think I'm done for the day. Okay. Uh, take care, everybody. Have a really good evening and some fun. Uh, the YouTube video will go up as soon as that figures out. And I will try and upload this and really hope that it saves all the annotations. But I will figure that out. Okay, take care. Bye.